Good. Great job today. Thanks for uh, covering for Jesse today and uh, appreciate your willingness to do that. Well, if you were to get in your car today here in Woodbury and decide you wanted to take a Sunday afternoon drive and head down to the southwest suburbs and work your way to the community of Chanhassen, somewhere off of Highway 5 to your right, you would see this building arise, and uh, it looks like this. It's called the Temple of Eck. If you go to the Temple of X website, uh, this is what you'll read about the temple. The temple is the worldwide center for the teachings of light, of the light and sound of God. Locating at the, located at the heart of the Eckenkar Spiritual Campus, it is a local community church and a golden wisdom temple. Seekers of truth come here for the spiritual study of past lives, dreams, and soul travel. Now, if you ever go to a church and that's what the church is specializing in, run fast, get away. One of the tenets of Eck is that Christ is God and all men are God. And um, the Temple of Eck is built with this unusual kind of golden ziggurat at the top there of, uh, of their, their building. It's what they're known for. And uh, it is built that way because it's supposed to symbolize a place where humanity reaches for God and God reaches down to humanity and the two meet at that point. Harold Klemp, the spiritual leader of Akinkar, says, any of you who visit the Temple of Ak will find that it has a special character, a presence of its own. The presence is the love of God. Later, if you ever need spiritual help at bedtime, imagine yourself back at the temple. Ask um, the question that you need help with, then just go to sleep, and often you'll awake in the morning with an entirely different view of the situation. And if you go to their website and you watch the video, that video uh, has been around for like 30 years, and it's said with this kind of hauntingly... Uh, voice, and, uh, and, and that's kind of the tenet of the church. That's why you come to the Temple of Eck. Paul Twitchell, in an Eckenkar publication, The Flute of God, wrote, we are, God, we are gods, of course, but gods of our own universe, and gods among other gods. Every man, woman, and child is God. Eckenkar is just one of thousands of cults or religions that teach that uh, it is the goal or the true existence of every man, woman, boy, and girl, that they are either going to become a god or that they are already god. And what is it with humanity that makes us want to be people who take the place of god? I want to say at the very beginning today, you're not god and you never will be, okay? You're never going to hear that taught here at Woodbury Community Church. You're never going to see that taught in scripture. God is god and God alone. John Denver, the famous singer, uh, before he passed away in that plane crash several years ago, said, one of these days I'll be so complete I won't be a human. I'll be a God. Shirley MacLaine, the New Age actress in her book Dancing in the Light, wrote, know that you are God. The Mormon Church, in volume three of their journal on discourses, says, the Lord created you and me for the purpose of becoming gods like himself. Now, oftentimes we hear, well, the Mormon church, isn't that just another Christian denomination? Isn't, aren't they just like us? No, they're not like us at all, really, other than they call themselves a church and they meet and sing some of the same songs and use some of the same scriptures, but they have this extra book and then all sorts of discourses that essentially say our goal as human beings is that we're going to become gods ourselves. Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon church who received that vision from the angel Moroni that became the Book of Mormon, he says, uh, oftentimes used to say, you've got to learn how to be gods yourself. M. Scott Peck wrote a best-selling book in the 1980s. It was kind of a whole new view of psychotherapy called The Road Less Traveled. In that book, he writes, what is it that God wants of us? It is for individuals to become totally holy God. And that's absolute nonsense. It isn't God's goal for us to become God's. Right, one more. Oprah Winfrey's um, spiritual guru, Eckhart Tolle, writes that God, in God, the scripture is saying, is formless consciousness and the essence of who you are in his best-selling book, A New Earth. And I'd love to say that A New Earth hasn't had any impact on Christian circles, but I can't tell you how many Christian homes that I've been in. And when I look at the bookshelves, because that's what pastors do sometimes, we love looking at bookshelves. Now I'm never going to get invited to your homes, I know that. But um, I see this book on Christian home after Christian home after Christian home kind of tucked in these areas of teachings on spirituality. But all it is is this this disguised age-old lie that we 
ought to become gods ourselves or our gods ourselves. I could go on and on and on with quotes. And I went to one website this week that had about 150 such quotes. There are all sorts of people that believe this deception that I want to call an age-old deception. It is a deception that is as old as eternity past when Satan himself was deceived into believing that he should be God. He, in his pride and uh, his arrogance, said he wanted to ascend to the throne of God. Eventually, he was kicked out of heaven with a third of the angels of heaven that he led in a rebellion. And then um, when humanity was created in the Garden of Eden, that deception is present again, where Satan, in the form of a serpent, deceives Adam and Eve into believing that they will be like God, knowing good from evil, if they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they should ignore God's instruction and do what they want to do and essentially become their own gods. There's this deception that says that we can be God um, that is alive and well on planet Earth today. Several years ago, the Arizona Republic ran a story about a young man in his 30s who was filthy, filthy rich. The man's name is Gordon Hall. I want to ask you a question. How many of you have ever heard of Gordon Hall? Okay, one or two of you in this room have heard of Gordon Hall. Yeah, I I hadn't heard of Gordon Hall. And I asked the question because listen to the story. You would think everybody in this room today would know who Gordon Hall is. It is dusk. Gordon Hall stands at the overlook on his 55,000 square foot mansion in Paradise Valley. It's quite the crib, isn't it? I mean, that's a big house. It was built by Pittsburgh industrialist Walter McCune and now owned and being renovated by Hall. He is 32 years old and a millionaire many times over. He stares at the range of lights stretching out before him from horizon to horizon and breathes a deep, relaxed sigh. The lights of the city are like campfires of a great army to Hall who sees himself as its benevolent general. They are like flashlights of the world's fortune seeker and Hall is their beacon to riches. They are for Hall like stars of the firmament. He is worth more than $100 million, he says, because it was his goal to be worth more than $100 million by the age of 33. There are other goals. By the time he's 38, he will be a billionaire. By the time his earthly body expires, he is convinced that he can live to be 120 years old. He will assume what he believes to be his just heavenly reward. Gordon Hall will be a god. He says, we have always existed as intelligences and spirits. He says, we are down here to gain a body. As man is now, God once was. And as God is now, man can become. If you believe it, then your genetic makeup is to be a God. And I believe it. And that is why I can do anything. My genetic makeup is to be a God. My God in heaven creates worlds and universes. And I believe I can do anything too. And the story ends by saying, he looks into the horizon and then looks behind him where his dark house seems to drift like a ship in the night sky. The Arizona Republic, when trying to figure out what title they would put on that article, put a a mocking title on there. They said, Behold, exclamation point, Gordon Hall has millions and they shall make him a god. Well, you know, very few of us, only two in this room had ever even heard of Gordon Hall. The article was written in 1983. He didn't become a billionaire. He eventually lost the beautiful house. It only took three years for him to lose it. Real estate agents today say that that is the 11th largest home in the United States, but they have difficulty finding buyers for it. The price on this house keeps coming down because it takes an estimated $100,000 to $200,000 a month just to maintain the residence. Um, the last known owner of the home uh, was the heir to the Hormel fortune. And so we have a little Minnesota angle to the story. Spam bought the house, all right? But it's, a, uh, it's an amazing, amazing deal. In 1997, here's what happened to Gordon. An FBI sting found him guilty of stock manipulation. By the time he was charged with the crime, the mansion was long gone and he was virtually penniless. The New York Times did a follow-up piece on the story and said... Gordon Hall has been, had been king of the hill, literally. From his mansion atop the Sugarloaf Mountain in the Paradise Valley suburb of northeast, northeast of here, Mr. Hall could look down on Phoenix and spin his dreams. He would build a 62-story office tower in the city, he announced, more than a decade. He'd be a billionaire by 40. Mr. Hall fell short of the mark. Yeah, I'd say he fell short of the mark. You know, so there are many who have 
believed that they would somehow become gods. In fact, as we conclude our series on Genesis 1 through 11 today, as we put away the ancient history and move to something else in the next month, I want to suggest that all of those that I quite quoted earlier who either believe they're gods or will become gods, the Shirley MacLaine's, John Denver's, Harold Klemp's, Eckhart Tolle's, M. Scott Peck's, Gordon Hall types, are not too unlike the people that we find in Genesis 11. And actually, and unfortunately, from time to time, we're not too unlike them either. Kent Hughes quotes Francis Thompson in his commentary on Genesis. It's a po- poem, and it says this, In all man's Babylon, Babylon strive but to impart the grandeurs of his Babylonian heart. It takes a minute, probably takes reading that through two or three times to get what it is that Francis Thomas is saying there. But every one of us from time to time have this heart that is a Babylonian heart. Hughes continues, history demonstrates that Babylonian hearts are endemic to humanity. Centuries after the fiasco at Babel, Nebuchadnezzar strode over the ramparts of his holy palace and declared, Is this not great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty in Daniel 4.30? Centuries later, when King Herod, decked out in his royal livery, addressed his people, they shouted, The voice of a god and not the man in Acts 12.22. He writes, the litany of history's Babylonian hearts roll easily from our lips. Alexander the Great, Caesar Augustus, when he died, some feared God had died. Louis XIV, the sun king, Stalin, who encouraged those who were weary to think of him, and then they wouldn't be weary anymore. Of course, we don't need history to understand this. We have the imperial self, our tendency to become many potentates, to become these many kings and queens that rule our own Uh, thrones, to exalt our little Babylonian hearts to the thrones in our lives. You know, it's true. We do have Babylonian hearts from time to time. In Genesis 11, as it opens, uh, it opens in the heels of Genesis 10, where last week we kind of just skimmed to the surface of Genesis 10. It's this table of nations. It's the descendants of Noah. And it's this telling of where all these descendants from Noah and Ham and Shem and Ham and Japheth and, and their sons, where they ended up going to. But everything we read about in Genesis 10 happened, um, or most of what we read about there, happened after an event in Genesis chapter 11. If you recall last week, we said that there was one of Noah's sons who was this particularly wicked son. His name was Ham. He dishonored his father. Ham had some sons of his own. Noah would declare a curse on one of those sons, his son Canaan, his fourthborn. That was the line that the Canaanites came out of, and they were kind of the mortal enemies of the people of God, the, 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 the Israelites. But he had other sons too. And in Genesis 10, 8 through 12, we read about the son of Ham's oldest son, his grandson, a guy named Nimrod. Now, I don't know anybody who names their sons Nimrod today, all right? It's just not a name that has stuck throughout the centuries. And for good reason. This Nimrod guy was uh, quite the character. Look at Genesis 10, 8 through uh, 12. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on the earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. From the land, he went into Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ur, Kala, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala. That is the great city. Now, it's important to know about those events. I know those aren't real exciting words to read in the Bible, but they set a framework for what's happening in Genesis 11, 1 through 9, where we come upon this place called Babel or Babel. It's the place that Nimrod's kingdom began in the land of Shinar. His kingdom was one that would expand exponentially out of Babel, probably after the Tower of Babel incident, but it's one of these things that that, uh, just happens. By the way, Nimrod, okay, told you the character, it's also a real interesting name. Here's why people probably don't name their sons Nimrod. The name Nimrod literally means we will rebel. What a great name for a son, all right? So as you're looking in the baby name book, what are you going to name your son or daughter? Nobody picks Nimrod because it means we will rebel. Can you imagine? And yet it makes sense that one of the descendants of Ham, Cush, would name his son, we will rebel, because he was mad. He was mad at what God had done. He was, he was mad at the, the fact that his grandfather's line had been cursed 
And there is no doubt that it was an appropriate name because of the rebellious hearts of the residents of Babel, the ancient precursor to the city of Babylon. That's who we have described for us in Genesis 11. One more thing before we go on to verse 1. This is a place that's located in where a modern-day Iraq now is. And you remember, at the beginning of our series on Genesis, in Genesis 2, we started talking about the Garden of Eden. We talked about some possible locations for that. We know that the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers flowed through the Garden of Eden. There's a couple other mysterious rivers that are no longer in existence, probably because of the flood or time or whatever. But um, there's a couple possible locations for the Garden of Eden. And then you get to Genesis 11, 2. You get to this land of Babel, and it's in the land, the plain, in the land of Shinar. And that is also in that same region by the Tigris and the Euphrates. And so ancient history, as recorded in the Bible, begins and ends in Genesis 1 through 11 in this area around the Tigris and Euphrates River that even to this day is one of the most talked about regions in the world. All week long, the news stories have been talking about Iraq and what's happening there. And there have been questions and there have been debates about how do we handle the uprisings that are taking place there and the new terrors. And this is a place that has continually been a hotbed. And oh, by the way, in both cases, the Garden of Eden and the Tower of Babel incidents, the inhabitants of the land are eventually expelled from that land. So let's go to the story. Look at verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as the people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. So we're now in the post-flood world. These are the descendants of Noah and his family. And from the beginning, something is wrong. From the beginning, they are living up to Nimrod's name. They are rebelling against what it is that God's told them to do. Because in Genesis 9-1, when the people came off the ark, God said, I want you to fill the whole earth. And they've decided, we don't want to fill the whole earth. We want to come to one region. We want to live together in one place with one language. And we're going to kind of do what we want to do. And it's interesting that Moses uses those words in the east or the east. Every time you see that phrase or that word used in the book of Genesis, it marks the people whom God has chosen, the people whom God wants to bless, choosing to willingly walk in rebellion away from God. If you had a pen and you had your Bible and you went through Genesis, every time you circle that uh, they are moving from the east, it is the symbol of them moving away from God. Moses does a lot of intriguing Uh, things with the literature that he is writing here. Look at verse 3. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Again, Moses does something interesting here. He wants to show the inferiority of the building materials that the people were using. The children of Israel, by the time Moses is on the scene and he is writing, are known for the incredible job that they do in building They're people who are famous for their works with stone and mortar, a much better alternative to the bricks and bitumen that were used by many of the pagan societies of the day. And what Moses is trying to do, and the first century readers would have seen, but maybe we don't see when you see things like brick and bitumen, because it doesn't mean much to us, is he's saying, listen, the children of God had chosen to basically adopt the, 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 the pagan... Uh, and really begin this pagan ritual of erecting these ziggurats to these pagan gods. Mesopotamian society would continue to use these bricks and this bitumen to make these kind of altars, these, these, these uh, um, not even altars really, but pyramid-looking things that continue to um, be seen around the Middle East in ruins. And they were always built as a place where the gods would descend to meet with the people. That was what they were to symbolize so they could bring heaven to earth sounds a little bit to me like the temple that we described that's in Chanhassen earlier today. They still use, except they made theirs golden, but still use that ziggurat symbol as that type of place. Look at verse 11. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top to the heavens. And come, let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Okay, could have been the very first attempt at the ziggurat. Pagan cultures would continue to build that. Why did they want to build such a tower? They wanted to do it to make a name for themselves. It was all about human pride. It was all about human arrogance. Saddam Hussein, the former ruler of Iraq, was obsessed with making a name for himself. At the height of his power, the ruler of Iraq was also obsessed with building the new Babylon. He had decided that he was going to restore the glory of Babylon and the Babylonian empire to Iraq. 
He was enthralled with King Nebuchadnezzar and the way that Nebuchadnezzar ruined and, uh, ruled and wanted to see Iraq uh, brought to that glory. So in 1983, Saddam Hussein started rebuilding the city of Babylon on top of the old ruins. He had his name inscribed in several of the bricks. The bottom right there is a picture of, of the, an example of those bricks uh, with, uh, to, to imitate Nebuchadnezzar. One of the frequent inscriptions reads, This was built by Saddam Hussein, son of Nebuchadnezzar, to glorify Iraq. And these bricks, after the uh, Gulf War, became these sought-after collector's items. The ruins today are no longer being restored. Uh, there are some groups that are trying to restore them. They call it one of the most important archaeological sites on the earth. You can go on YouTube and see all these videos, but because of the violence in the region, they can go for a little while, and then they have to start all over again. There's been extensive damage to the ruins that are there. But like Saddam Hussein, so many of us will go to great lengths to make a name for ourselves. See, pride's a seductive thing that way. And in the trying and the grasping and the time committing, we oftentimes find ourselves making a name for ourselves, but in the end being miserable. Many of you know I was a youth pastor for many years before I became a pastor. And when I was a youth pastor, I would talk to parents all the time who would say to me, what's wrong with my kids? Why can't I, you know, what, what, what's happening with them? And I'd talk to the kids and try to get their perspective. And time, time again, I'd hear these teenagers say, my dad doesn't have any time for me. My mom doesn't have any time for me. They're so busy with whatever it is that they're doing that there isn't time for me. I was talking to a young mom earlier this week who's faced with that agonizing decision. She's a single mom trying to figure out, so do I put my young child in daycare and really, really, really focus on making a ton of money in this new career that she's, she's, she's chosen to be a part of? Or do I make a little bit less money, not dedicate quite as much time to this career? It's a sales-type career. And, um, and, uh, and, and be around for my daughter more. She said, I'm thinking what I need to do is just, just put her in daycare a whole lot more. And then her comment to me was, because when she's a teenager, then I will have established myself in this business, and then we'll have time together. And, you know, I, I had a hard time with her. You know, I had a hard time knowing how, how do I help this young woman? What, what advice do I, do I give her? Because she's got to, you know, make enough money to take care of her family, and yet at the same time, when is enough enough? And how she could know when enough is enough. And by saying goodbye to those formative, incredibly difficult, you know, precious days uh, and hoping that somehow when her child's a teenager that her child will just kind of forget and have a great time because they've made a lot of money. I, I don't know. It's a tough thing. But I know that at least in the case of this young woman, one of the parts of the struggle for her is that she's desiring to make an incredibly great name for herself in the industry she's chosen. And by doing so, is she going to forget about that responsibility? I, I don't know. Here's what I know Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added to you. Too often times we seek first our own kingdoms. Verse 5 of Genesis 11 says, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower where the children of man, that the children of man had built. And by the way, it's Moses using satire again. Okay, because God lives everywhere, right? He's omnipresent. So he didn't literally have to come down to see what it was that they were building. He was trying to paint this picture to his first readers of like a dad whose little child says to him, hey, daddy, look at the ant on the ground that I just found. And there's tons of little ants there. And so the daddy gets down on the ground as the little child tries to point out the ant from all the other little ants and finds that ant on the ground. And that's the kind of picture that Moses is trying to paint of God coming down to see this tower, which the people thought was so great, but really is so small in comparison with God and the universe that he made. And so the Lord sees what it is that man is doing. And verse 6 says, And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing they propose to do will be impossible for them. And if you just read those words, sometimes you can get the impression that God's a little bit threatened here. That, uh-oh, what's going to happen if man advances too quickly? Are they going to become like God? God isn't threatened. God's never been threatened by, by his creation. He wasn't afraid that the people were somehow going to become so advanced that they would surpass him. What the Lord was attacking here was self-sufficiency. The people had become so impressed with what they themselves could do that their hearts could have easily grown cold to what it was that 
God, uh, to, to, to the need that they had for God, thinking that the answers were somehow somewhere found from within by just coming together as the people of earth to accomplish great tasks. And I see that all the time today. We hear people say, you know, the solution to this world's problem is we just all need to come together. We need to get along. We need to throw aside our differences. We need to work in a solution to our problems. We can achieve peace on earth and real change. And those are all things that God loves but if it's outside of the gospel, the solutions ultimately lead to emptiness. Solutions that are devoid of God are no real solution at all. That's an arrogance that says, we don't need God. We can make it on our own. And that's the arrogance that the Babylonian hearts had. So in verses 7 to 9, the last verses we're going to talk about today, the Lord acts. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of the earth. The Tower of Babel is a story of human arrogance that meets God's judgment. Throughout Bab history, Babylon has been known for its arrogance and pride, for its godlessness, which attracts the judgment of God. Mankind's fulfillment is never going to come from becoming a god. It comes when we find our identity in Christ. It comes when we recognize that we are people who were created in the image of God to bring glory to him and honor to him, that we are created for his story, not the other way around. Genesis 11 ends with the genealogy of Abraham. Real people, real stories, real lives, and it is the hinge upon which the ancient history of the beginning of the Bible turns toward a more modern history. And this man Abraham and his descendants would become Israel. He was the man who would become the patriarch of God's chosen people. Genesis 1 through 11 isn't a collection of allegorical stories. It's not fake. These aren't fairy tales. It's real history. Sometimes there t there's the temptation to say, well, you know, Christians disagree on so much. You know, how old the earth is from the very first chapters of Genesis to did the Tower of Babel really happen? And did a worldwide flood really happen? No, it really happened. Real stories that have huge impact on us. There are Christian colleges and seminaries today that hire professors, schools that have been good schools over the years, that hire professors that say, ah, oh, you know what, these are just allegory. They're just stories. They're just there to teach us some spiritual truth. We shouldn't take these things literally. When you throw out the literal portion of that, the rest of Scripture um, doesn't make sense, and the rest of Scripture becomes up for debate as well. Babel was a real place. In fact, one of the videos that I watched of the work that's being done in Babylon and trying to restore that city, that important archaeological site that Saddam Hussein was working on, one of the things that they found is an ancient ziggurat, a, a work that had be, been started and was abandoned, and many of the bricks had been taken over the years to build people's residences, they, they guess, and, uh, but it's still there, some of the ruins from that. You can go there and see that. It's one of the reasons I've loved what our friends in Israel have done. Not only have they shared the gospel in that country so faithfully over the years, but they've studied the history for themselves. Those who had a chance to go to Israel with us a few years ago got to see that the stories of the Bible are real places that really happened. And so what should Genesis 1 through 11 have taught us these past few months? Number one, God's real. He's the creator of the universe. He created us, and he created us with a purpose but we're the created, not the creator. and We're never going to become the creator. He's always God. He's always in the throne. The people have a tendency to rebel. And God responds over and over and over and over again to people's rebellion with grace and forgiveness. As we have been forgiven, may we forgive others. As we've been shown God's grace, may we show it to others. We're going to pray and we're going to sing just one song as we close today. And... Um, and then uh, Catherine's asked me to tell you, if you're around today and can help with tearing some of this stuff down later on this afternoon, about 2 o'clock, there's going to be a work team coming to tear down some of the VBS stuff. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today and your graciousness. And Lord, again, we pray for our friends who've been serving you so faithfully in Israel these years and uh, who just a couple of hours ago received the tough news that they've got to leave and leave quickly if... Um, if uh, the, the procedure, um, the appeal doesn't go through. And so we pray for them. We pray that you would um, bless us this week, that you would help us to be people who live as uh, sons and daughters of God who have been 
changed because of your work of grace in our life. Give us the courage to share your truth with the world around us. Thank you for what you did this week, for the 21 kids who came to faith in Jesus, for the incredible things that happened in Haiti that uh, we're just beginning to hear about. And God just, uh, just worked in great ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we finish.